Could you go to Roshanara, please? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much. I wanted to, I've got some questions about CBILS and CLBLS. Um, so starting with uh, Sir John, um, did you or anyone else at the Bank of England suggest uh, CBILS or CLBLS as a route for Greensill Bank to accessing government-backed loans? No. Uh, in a, any any of the discussions, you you talked well, about. I wasn't earlier. I wasn't in the discussions of, with okay. Greensill. Did, did anyone in the uh, sorry? No, no. The I think, are you are you aware of anyone in the bank um, suggesting it? I'm I'm not absolutely not. Uh, Governor, I, I just, can I just I just I checked because you are, I know you asked this question about whether David Cameron mentioned this in a meeting with the bank. Yep. I checked it with the staff who were in the meeting. And that never came up. Great, thank you for yeah. that. You're thank welcome. you for that. That's really, really, really helpful. Um, can can um, can you just talk us through um, whether there was any any? Um, uh, I suppose it's linked to the point about the treasury earlier on. Uh, Sir John was talking about the um, the treasury asking the Bank of England if they could look at proposals to support Greensill. Um, given everything else that's going on, um, could what, I suppose one of the things that we are trying to understand is whether it, it's sort of it's a green silver was a bit like a hot potato that people kept passing on um, from one one place to another, um, and there is there is some uh, sense that it, I mean it landed with the British Business Bank and ultimately they did secure four hundred million. Uh, as you know, I have been asking uh, about that question. How on earth did this bank, given the violence I mentioned, given all the things we've just talked about, uh, SFO, FCA, um, be, you know, dealing with some elements of this when you were their governor, um, how hmm. this hop ended up in the hands of the British ban Business Bank and how on earth did taxpayers' money end up being released after all this? Well, uh, I just I... wondered reflections both of your reflections on that because ultimately the substance of this situation is ta taxpayers money ended up in the hands we of have, the I have to be honest with you I mean the, the Chancellor has set out the uh, situation on the British Business Bank both in his letter to the committee and indeed in the letter he wrote to the then Shadow Chancellor which set it out in some detail what I have to say to you is that we have um, we have no it wasn't very the, the answers weren't very <laughs> Very, very. Uh, well, I think you're going to have a chance. To ask, you'll have the chance to ask that question later in the week, and it's honestly better asked uh, then than today. I think. Can I just say we have no gateway uh, under statutes to the either to the British Business Bank or to the Department for Business. So we have no gateway to provide information. As I said earlier, we kept the Treasury fully informed, um, but we have no gateway to the uh, British Business Bank or to the uh, Department for Business. Um, um, so John was talking. So John, you were talking about the fact that you didn't feel the kind of pressure. Uh, you didn't feel uh, particularly under pressure to come up with something to satisfy uh, the Treasury, uh, given the intensity of lobbying. But he, he, Green Seal seems Green Seal's footprint seems to be uh, around the system a fair bit. Did either of you come across um, Mr. Green Seal? in the past in any capacity? Uh, I, I can honestly say I've never met Mr. Greensill, so uh, no, I've never exchanged emails with him or any other form of communication, so in no. At all? Yeah. Okay. At all, no. Um, um, can I just say that the implication that the Treasury were putting the Bank of England under pressure to do something, I, I, I mean, John will speak for himself, I never felt under any pressure the Treasury we, we were operating as the agent for the CCFF and we were doing that job and we were working very closely with the Treasury. And I think that it was a very successful operation. There was never any pressure on us, not, not at all. Maybe I'll just um, uh, answer a couple of questions. First of all, it didn't feel to me, I mean, I don't know what happened sort of uh, with uh, British Business Bank, it didn't feel to me like a hot potato at all. Um, they came in with a proposal it didn't meet the rules and we told them very quickly it doesn't meet the rules they then said can you change the rules and whatever and we said no we can't change the rules talk to the treasury if you want uh, if you want that and i've said that uh, to others on the and then they came back with something and they said did it meet the rules and it wasn't it didn't take very long to say no nope, it doesn't meet the rules um so it, it didn't feel to me like it was a big thing i think the call for evidence on the general question 
question. Sure. I can imagine of... being able to push you or the governor around uh, and keep you put you under pressure. Um, yes. Uh, yes. So you're seasoned operators in in this yes. in this territory. But I do want to come to this point about the treasury making a announcement. Much you know, there's been a, a month of activity, month and a half of activity over March. Uh, and then in on the March on March 19th, you had the Treasury um, announcing the CL, this the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, which is the scheme that the Greensill Bank uh, did succeed in accessing. So you will appreciate um, mm. yeah. that the, the Treasury, you you robustly went back to the Treasury, but the Treasury did come up with a plan which did was successful in terms of Mr. Greensill and co being able to access funds through the British Business Bank? Well, I think the context to put that into is that there was a, we were all working very hard at that stage to ensure that financing was available to, to British business. So it's not about Mr. Greensill, this was about British business. And we were obviously in a, we were in an unprecedented and pretty, pretty desperate yep. sort of situation at that point. Um, and so there was a lot of activity to say, you know, how do we get uh, financing out to those who need it? And I, I think the sort of, the, in a sense, the sort of the, the sort of sense of what was going on behind this was also, you know, are, are we leaving any important gaps in the coverage of these schemes, which we will regret in terms of the impact on the economy? I mean, a lot of the work we were doing with the Treasury was saying, you know, have we got the bases covered? Yeah. Um, I, can I just come on to come on to uh, the wider issues? You talked about regulatory perimeter, Governor, um, and that this particular case didn't didn't wouldn't have amounted to systemic failure. But we've seen signs of sort of securitization type stuff going on. What would it have taken uh, for uh, you know how big would a green seal type case have to be to cause or multiple cases have to be? be to mean systemic failure and with these sorts yeah. of cases because it doesn't fall in the regulatory perimeter what we end up with is taxpayers ending up suffering but the regulators can't act the system doesn't kick in to protect people um, and we don't have the early warning if you like the early warning systems don't really go far enough to deal with potential future systemic failures what, what are your reflections on that well i mean it's uh, the test of systemic failure uh, that I would apply from a financial stability point of view is twofold. One, uh, the effect on the real economy. So was, was Greensill's activity uh, of sufficient scale or nature that it was affecting the, the real economy? I mean, and of course, it, you know, it might be big or it might be specialist in particular niches. Uh, and, and the answer there is no. Um, he's, if you know, if I'm honest with you... Sorry. So apologies, Governor. This, I meant uh, taking that, uh, not necessarily the specific case, but what sort of... How big would something like that have well, to be? Okay, so I was trying to generalise and say, you know, so effect on the real economy, yeah, scale of, 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 of that activity and that business in terms of its impact on the real economy. And the second, the second test is the interconnectivity of the financial system. Is it some piece of the financial system which is so interconnected and therefore likely to cause damage to other parts of the financial system that the sort of the systemic impact is, is something that you know, we couldn't... Uh, we couldn't allow it to happen for that reason without being concerned about the damage. Now, as I say, I don't think you pass either of those tests. And just one final one on insurance. Um, Mr. Greensill talked about the insurance provider letting him down, uh, yeah. letting the company yeah. down. Um, what What are the kind of lessons around accounting and insurance out of this case? Would you Would you say? Well, I mean, he so, so it was an Australian insurance company. Um, he. I mean, has, has suggested, I know, in, in, in his evidence to you that there's some, there's some problem with insurance regulation, that it's pro-cyclical and that, the, that it tightens, uh, you know, at times like this. It has, I mean, I, I think Australian regulation is not that different to ours. It has a certain amount of pro-cyclicality, mm -hmm. but that's not the reason he got into the problem. There's two reasons mm -hmm. he got into the problem. One, because as far as I understand it, that, insurance, that Australian insurer was exceeding its underwriting limits to him. That was an internal control failure. And they realized it and pulled the limit back and cut the limits. Um, secondly, I think his business model was excessively dependent on insurance. I mean, the problem is he couldn't sell his, his, um, his, his paper, his notes, in the absence of insurance cover. So once the insurance cover uh, fell away, he went from sort of, you know, uh, everything to nothing. And that's a, you know, that's, a, that's a vulnerability in his business model that he should afford about. 
And, and do you think that that sort of business model is deeply problematic? And, and uh, as you've heard, some people have defined it as showing the hallmarks of a Ponzi scheme. Uh, should we be looking out for things like that? Um, I don't think it's a Ponzi scheme. I, I have to say, I think Paul Miners uses the word Ponzi scheme rather liberally because it's not in the sort of traditions of uh, Mr. Ponzi and his, or senior Ponzi, whatever, whatever he was. Um, you know, that's, the Ponzi scheme is a different, different animal. It had a, it had a structural, a big structural, it had more than one structural weakness in it probably, but one of them was this reliance on insurance cover, um, uh, excessive reliance. And, and you said, uh, you, you, there are a number of people who've said this, and you said it today about, being, uh, about supply chain finance not needing regulation. But this particular case, and, and I hear what you're saying, but this particular case where supply chain finance has been distorted, shall we say, um, perhaps that you'll come up, you'll give me a better, better phrase than I can think of one, um, has led to a problem that is going to cost taxpayers money. Uh, what are your reflections for either, what question for either of you really about how, where we go, where, go, where we go from here to avoid this sort of thing happening in the future? Both for, reflecting on your FCA days as well as... <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me offer you one reflection, um, and you know, I'm going to have to be careful here because I'll come across as a luddite, and I don't mean this to be a luddite at all. Actually, look, innovation is a good thing, but you just have to be very—we all have to be very clear-eyed about innovation. It's easy to get carried away with financial innovation. I'm afraid I've seen it. Honestly, some of the discussions, some of the sort of rather painful discussions we've had in this committee, you know, in past in the past, have had that theme to it. Um, yep. There's an awful lot of enthusiasm for innovation, um, and it's a good thing. So please, you know, I don't want to be labelled as the person who's against innovation. Not, not at all. It's a good thing. But there's the danger that everybody, you know, we get carried away. Um, you know, it's, it, it's why I'm, you know, sceptical about um, crypto assets, frankly, because, um, you know, they're, they're dangerous and there's a huge enthusiasm out there. So, so, so to both of you, to Sigon and to you, because you both presided over the financial crisis and survived that and helped us get through that. Um, do we think that actually there's a, there's a, there's, there are people who've gone off to innovate so-called, actually it's not innovation, they're coming up with new schemes to, to that is going to create, wreak havoc, even if it doesn't fall in, into the regulatory perimeter, we should be looking for this stuff, which could become a big oh, it's, it, it, I mean, in a way it's ever present. If you draw a, a line around something and say it's regulated inside, there will always be, be people trying to do it outside. I mean, John Johnson had massive experience as well, he'll help you on this too. Sorry, Sir John, you're muted. What one sees happening repeatedly is a, is a good and sensible idea. Um, so securitization of mortgages um, you know, is, is a useful way of allowing, say, insurance companies and others to have exposure to mortgages. Uh, but, um, and then people use it uh, sensibly, but then uh, people take it too far or it gets abused. Um, I think supply chain financing you know, if, uh, with, with a fintech bent that enables SMEs to get their money early in their bank account without huge hassle and, and perhaps paying lower charges. That's a good thing. But like all things, it's not the thing itself. It's the motivation and what you try and do with it. And you know, th there are many reasons to regulate, not just financial stability. There's consumer protection, investor protection. Actually, Green Seal is regulated for money laundering and AML. So yeah, financial stability is not the only game in town if people are worried about risk. But my own view on this is, I think, in the end, um, and uh, the governor mentioned this, it, it's, it's to do in part with the auditors. And the auditors have to say why a company is using supply chain financing and what the motivation is and whether actually it's trying to disguise its real indebtedness or whether it's using it for another purpose. But, um, uh, but you often see sensible ideas um, turn into subprime. Thank you so much. Thanks, Roshanara.